Good morning. Welcome to Let's Bet It here on PicksWise, PicksWise.com. I'm Mark Zeno, joined by Brandon Marcello. Make sure you guys download that PicksWise app. It's available at the Apple Store and Google Play as well. Subscribe to the PicksWise YouTube channel. Let us know in the comments what plays you have, what questions you have. We'll try to get to them all. We've got a huge Saturday of college football to get to today. We will get to some of the key games for today as well. College football playoff rankings, national championship odds, Heisman Trophy odds, and of course, our plays of the day. Welcome in, Brandon. Uh, I don't know how excited you are for college football. I know my kids were excited at 7 o'clock this morning, jumping up and down to my bed saying, Daddy, there's college football on today. Daddy, there's college football on today. Except that's not what they were saying. They were just saying, Daddy, get up, uh, make me breakfast. But same thing in my world. You know, let's, let's go. We've got a big day ahead of us. Huge day, man. I got my extra wide monitors set up. I can watch up to eight games at the same time. I, it's going to be insane today. It is. It is. All right, let's dive into some of the key games for this week. And the first one we were talking a little bit about before we got on the air here, Alabama and Ole Miss. Alabama laying 11 and a half points. This line has moved a little bit in favor of Ole Miss with a total uh, that has moved up around 65 right now, depending on where you're looking. Now, Alabama 5-0 and against the number in their last five games. Following a loss, Ole Miss, conversely, won at six ATS in their last seven home games. Here's some background for you, Brandon. Alabama has not lost more than two games before Thanksgiving since 2010. Alabama has not lost back-to-back -back games since Nick Saban's first year in Tuscaloosa, which was all the way back in 2008. So it's been quite some time since this Alabama's been facing this situation, though. What's your read on this game? Well, I, continuing all along with that, that line of logic, Alabama's never lost three straight road games under Nick Saban. They've lost two straight at this point. They haven't lost two straight at all, no matter the venue, since 2007, the first year of the Nick Saban era. So we're on the cusp of some history here under Saban. Do I see that happening? Not so much. What I look through here, though, is some recent history. As we know, Lane Kiffin, everybody wants to put him up on this pedestal. This guy who can just figure out Nick Saban, score points in bunches. Absolutely he can. He's still 0-3 against the GOAT. But Alabama, I know they've been struggling, but they still got Bryce Young. And that offense in the last six games against Ole Miss, averaging 56.5 points in games against the Rebels. Alabama's won six of the last eight away games that have been decided by one score as well. So Bama can play close, but I'm starting to kind of get this feeling when I look at the personnel that this isn't going to be so close. And I can understand that line being where it's at right now. Um, and when I look at Ole Miss, that rushing average, they lean so much on the run. And I think that gets lost in the space for whatever reason from a lot of people out there. They just kind of think of Lane Kiffin and think, well, they're throwing the ball. Well, that hasn't been the case all season with Jackson Dart at quarterback. They've been leading on Zach Evans and co. You know, they're third in the nation in rushing. They're the best by far outside the service academies right now. But Alabama. They've got two strengths. It's that rush D in that front seven, and it's Bryce Young at quarterback. He makes everything go for them. But Bama's defense, as much as everybody wants to be throwing them into the into the wood chipper right now, that front seven matches up very well against Ole Miss in this one. So I I I kind of I'm leaning toward Alabama actually covering this line and winning by two touchdowns because Ole Miss. They're allowing 31 points per game against SEC teams this year, no matter the venue. They gave up a lot of yardage, a lot of points against a terrible Auburn offense just a few weeks ago. I think Alabama's going to come out on fire today, and I think they're going to. I think they're going to potentially blow out Ole Miss on the road. All right. Well, I had that same thought last week when they were laying the same exact number on the road against LSU. Now you could argue LSU is a better team than Ole Miss. We don't 100% know that yet. I think what two things are working against Ole Miss in this spot. One, their strength of schedule to this point. They haven't really played anybody. As soon as they did play somebody in a competent team like LSU, what happened? They lost by two touchdowns in that game. However, I'll add two more notes here. One, that Alabama has typically, and Nick Saban have typically struggled against dual threat quarterbacks, which is exactly what Jackson Dart is. It's what Jaden Daniels is. So those rushing yards aren't necessarily straight hand the ball off to Evans and run the ball straight ahead kind of rushing yards. They are ones where the quarterback improvises and everything else and makes life difficult on the Saban defense. And two, this is a very sloppy Alabama team. They commit a lot of penalties. They make a ton of mistakes. Last week, I tore up my ticket backing Alabama as soon as Bryce Young threw that interception on the end zone on the very first drive. 
because I knew they were never going to recover. That was a very un Bryce Young like mistake. And as soon as he made it, I knew I was done for. So, my other thing in this whole situation, I told you this before we started uh, recording here or got on the air, was if Lane Kiffin, for all of his prowess as a coach, with two weeks to prepare coming off a bye, and everything he has on the line here, possibly winning the SEC West, possibly going to the SEC Championship game, still staying in line for a New Year's Six Bowl. If he lays a dud today against Nick Saban, there should be hell to pay. I'm not saying that Ole Miss has to win the game. I'm not saying that Ole Miss you know, has to go out there and, and play perfect and destroy Alabama. I'm just saying if they lose by more than two touchdowns and don't cover this game, there should be hell to pay because you can't let that happen. That's just the way I view this whole thing. Hey, and here's the thing. Everybody keeps propping up Lane Kiffin, as I said, against Alabama, but they've lost by two touchdowns or more in the last two meetings. So well, I, I, yeah. I, I see I that. We want to, I would come back to that that LSU got destroyed by Nick Saban every single year other than the Joe Burrow year, and look what happened last week. Certainly, but I, I, I you're right. This Alabama team is so much different than what we've seen yeah. in the past, but I still – I'm looking at these matchups with personnel – Unless, I think Jackson Dart's got to do something through the air for them to, to be able to even sure. cover in this one, sure. I think. I get it. All right. Uh, for the second straight week, we'll go under the lights in Starkville, Mississippi, uh, as the Mississippi State Bulldogs host that other Bulldogs team, you know, the other one, the number one team in the nation called Georgia. Um, they are laying 16 and a half, total set of 53. Under is 4 0 in the last Georgia uh, four road games, and the over is 5 0 for Mississippi State at their last five home games. So, uh, Mississippi State, uh, I'm a little bit mad at uh, at them. Best bet last week, sitting there at halftime, 24 to 6, like, yeah, let's just run this last 30 minutes out. We'll be good to go. Then Mississippi State forgot there was a second half of football to play both offensively and defensively uh, and ended up, uh, you know, just eking out an overtime win over Auburn, which was gross. Anyway, uh, I don't like this matchup for Mississippi State at all. When you look at Mississippi State, you know, they have been shut down by the two other best defenses in the SEC. That's Alabama and Kentucky. They held them to six and 17 points, respectively. I think UGA should have no problem keeping this offense in check. I think it does probably stay under that 53 total. And Georgia ends up winning a very similar game to what Alabama did, 35 to 10, somewhere in that range, something like that. But I would back Georgia here, uh, and I'd take the under as well. I'm I'm with you there on both points there. I, I think with Mississippi State, they we talk a lot about their red zone offense. They're second best in the FBS right now. Georgia's red zone defense, best in the FBS, allowing touchdowns on only 29.4% of possessions. And, of course, Georgia's only allowed five passing touchdowns all season. Will Rogers has 26 touchdown passes for Mississippi State. I, I love this Georgia defense. It's by far the best defense we've seen. Here these last two seasons. In fact, I was going through some historical data earlier. This is the second best defense over a two-year span, maybe since the FBS and the FCS split off since 1978 when we looked at back-to-back -back seasons. This Georgia defense is legit. I'm with you. Uh, I'm 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 eager here. I, I think Georgia covers, and I think that the we stay under that total even even so. I think Mississippi State's not really going to be able to do anything offensively. And what you saw Georgia do against Tennessee last week with that passing game and that wet weather, it's not going to be like that, uh, obviously, with the weather in Starkville. But I, Mississippi State's going to – Will Rogers is going to have some interceptions today, and Georgia's going to capitalize <laughs> and then just put their foot down on the throat in the second half and run all the way back home to Athens. And uh, it's going to be a boring think, second I half, I think. Yeah, it is. I think the only concern you have is if Georgia gets bored like they did against Florida, <laughs> turns the ball over in back-to-back -back possessions and lets them back in the game. You know, again, Georgia ultimately comes out and covers that game anyway. But the point simply is, is that, you know, that's the only thing that keeps this game even remotely close if Georgia decides to get sloppy. I'll say it again because I've said it all year long. Nobody is beating Georgia but Georgia. End of discussion. That's about it. All right. Um, let's head out west. You know, since Chip Kelly left Oregon, um, the Oregon Trail, the one that I knew growing up, was littered with dysentery, typhoid, fording the river, and everything else. It's been bad. But since Dan Lanning has taken over, the Oregon Trail has been littered with nothing but 40-point games, blowouts, covers all over the place. I mean, I'm on the Oregon train and have been all year long. So another game where they are laying double digits in conference here against Washington, number at 13, total set at 72 and a half. 
Washington is 0-4 against a spread in their last four road games. And the favorite in these last 18 meetings, 15-2-1. You know, Washington sort of dominated this series for a while now, but this is a different Oregon team. Uh, I am the only – I feel like I'm the only person on the East Coast who's been pumping Oregon this entire year uh, as, I, as I've cashed on them routinely uh, in certain spots this season here, Brandon. But, you know, I simple question. How does Washington stop this Oregon offense? The short answer is they don't. Um, Bo Nix has been fantastic, and we thought all these Bo Nix home road splits were going to be a deal this year. Nope. Bo Nix is great everywhere. 22 touchdowns passing, 13 more rushing. He should be in every Heisman conversation as much as Hendon Hooker and uh, C.J. Stroud are. Unfortunately, he's not. But, you know, I, I know that Washington can score, and they will. But I think we are not watching enough Oregon football and just looking at the numbers going, oh, well, they can be beat here. Oh, they get No, they push people around. This has become the most physical team in the Pac-12. I think they roll today and cover easily against Washington. I'm with you, exactly. And that's the key right there. Oregon is so physical in the trenches, especially the yep. offensive line. Bo Nix has only been sacked once this entire season. That's number one in the FBS. No one has got to him. And that's when everybody talks about and jokes about the Bo Nix experience. You know, remember previously at Auburn, him running for his life, creating plays, throwing against LSU last year. It's because he had a remember terrible we offensive were line. Running for his life in Georgia. <laughs> exactly. But here's the thing. Washington can't really get to the quarterback. That defense has been atrocious in some big key spots this season. There's going to be a lot of points put up on the board. Oregon, though, is still going to cover that. They're going to win going away. Listen to this number with Bo Nix, by the way, and I'm with you. He needs to be in that Heisman discussion. He's only the fourth quarterback since 2000 with 20-plus pass touchdowns and 13-plus rushing touchdowns at this Jeez. point in the season. The wow. only other three quarterbacks are by the names of Tim Tebow. Tebow. Yeah. yeah. Give me another. Um, since 2000, we're going to have to go way back. It's not Michael He's, Vick. Um, yeah, not Michael Vick. Is it Michael Vick? No, not Michael. It's Give me not. the other two. We'll be here all day. Lamar Jackson and Jalen Hurts. Jackson. Oh, okay. Reason guy. Wow. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. Isn't that crazy? Right. See, I'm, but, I'm, 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 I'm trying to go older, like, you know, way back when. Anyway, <laughs> that's insane. I mean, Vic, that, that tells you how good he's been this year. It's fa He's been fantastic. And it's because that offensive line has just given him – a lot of time. I remember going into the season talking to people on that staff about how I don't know about our receivers right now and all that, but we got a pretty good offensive line. If we could build around that, and boy, they just been mauling opponents. And I don't think Washington's going to know what hit them in the trenches today. Brandon, you, you've covered the SEC a lot. I'll ask you two questions here about Oregon. One, they run the table. Are they one hundred percent in the college football playoff? They need they need TCU to lose um, potentially to help them, but. I, I, I think so. You so. Think I think. Get in, I, see, I don't think. I think if they run the table and end up twelve and one with the Pac-12 championship, that means they have beaten Utah. Well, they've beaten Washington, a ranked Washington. They've beaten Utah. They've beaten UCLA, uh, and they would have beaten USC. And th those are teams that have been ranked in the top twenty-five pretty much all year long. And you can say what you want about the Pac-12 schedule, but la going into last week, the Pac-12 was the only Power Five conference with six teams with at least six wins. The only power five. So I think we're undervaluing here, and, and people want to talk about the competition. The way Oregon has played, scoring 40 points in every single game for eight consecutive games, it's going to be nine this week, by the way. Um, and they might even put up a 50 burger this week as well. The way they hey, they're played, averaging the they 50 just, at home this year. It's been unreal. Um, there is no reason if they were, they, they are not. Hey, maybe maybe so, but I I knowing that committee and the way we look at things right now. We're moving toward there's going to be two Big Ten teams, two SEC teams, or there might be three SEC teams in the playoff this year that you could you could argue for, depending on what LSU does here the rest of the way, and we're going to talk about them later. But Tennessee is in a really great spot, I think, to get into the playoff as long as Georgia doesn't just stub its toe because I, Tennessee I, I, yeah, I, is yeah. going to be able to say – Tennessee is going to be able to say in that committee, this matters to the committee when they look at criteria – they look at which teams were ranked at the time they played, and Tennessee is 5-1 and one against teams when they were ranked at the time. They're going to look at that, and they're also going to say they played, they played Georgia a little bit better than Oregon. We know it was at the beginning of the season, near the end of the season. They're, they're going to let Tennessee in that, in that party if that ends up happening. 
Well, I hope not because Tennessee is going to get bounced in the first round of the playoffs quite <laughs> set resoundly because their pass defense is terrible. Um, and, yep. and the methodology which they play – and remember, they were one play away from losing that Bama game. One stinking play. And that's it. So I'm not going to sit here and reward Tennessee to that level when I've watched Oregon dominate everybody with the exception of the best team in the nation – Week one, and everybody's stuck on the 46 point differential. But here was the second question, Brandon Georgia and Oregon meet in the Peach Bowl, which, oh, by the way, if Oregon is the four seed, right? How quirky is this? Georgia and Oregon opened up at Mercedes Benz Stadium in the Chick fil A kickoff classic. Two teams, same venue, same presenting sponsor, would meet again at Mercedes Benz Stadium in the Chick fil A Peach Bowl, deciding who's going to go play for a national championship. Weird and quirky. That said, Oregon and Georgia play now. I'm telling you that spread is probably the same as it is against Tennessee, eight and a half, nine in that range. But what do you think the outcome is? Oh, I already got a score in my head, 35-14. I, I, that's how I see that game like developing. Yeah, Oregon plays better, but I, I still think they've got some concerns on that defense, and Georgia is going to be able to play very well there in Atlanta. I was there for that game in week one. And just the mm -hmm. way they were able to demolish and you push left the first around. <laughs> well, hey, I was watching other games by the end of the first quarter. I'll tell you that on my laptop <laughs> in the press box. I Listen, man, or, Oregon just – they might be the most dominant team on the West Coast as far as the trenches, but Georgia made them look like a bottom-to-middle-rung yeah. SEC team in the trenches. And – that you don't change that during a season, even if your quarterback is playing better and your receivers are on the same page. You just don't change that. Oh, that's, that's true. Again, I, I just think that they've learned it. And I will give Dan Lanning a ton of credit. If there's anybody, and I said this going into week one because I took George, uh, Oregon getting the 18 and a half, you know, you see the disparity in the athletes. That's a little bit different between the SEC big boys and, and Pac 12 big boys. That I think definitively is a thing. But the way Dan Lanning makes them play probably plays a little bit closer to SEC style than mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of other Pac-12 teams are used to. All right, we'll stay sort of out west, but come back east a little bit toward the Midwest. TCU and Texas here. Texas now at minus 7.5. This line has finally moved at certain shops here. It was stuck on 7 all week long, a total of 65. The under is 5-2 and two in the last seven meetings. The under is 5-1 and one in the last six Texas home games here. You have the number four team in the land undefeated. Catching more than a touchdown here, Brandon. Isn't that crazy? This is right now going into this game. I was wait, I was actually kind of waiting for the maybe the line to drop a little bit, but TCU is going to be the first top five team since the FBS and FCS split to be an underdog by more than a touchdown against an unranked opponent. So to speak. Oh wow, yeah. In the AP in the AP. So Tennessee last week they were both yeah, ranked, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So here we are it just is in this incredible spot, but I can't stop focusing on it. And I was, I was in town for this game, Oklahoma State, Texas. I went and covered that game. And the way Texas just absolutely cannot do anything in the second half offensively of games this season is eye-opening to me. It is insane. And then you've got TCU, which is the best second-half team in all of college football. I, was at, I keep saying, this is where I was at. I was in Lawrence and watched TCU come back against – Kansas earlier this season. TCU has got a great quarterback of Max Duggan. We know that, of course. But what really makes them go in the second half of these games is they can start taking the top off with Quentin Johnston, and it starts making things that field seem so much more wide open for TCU, whereas those teams are still trying to figure th things out amongst each other, the defenses and the offenses in the first half. And TCU just figures it out with great coaching and some great skill players and a veteran quarterback. Texas. Goodness gracious, they've had six combined points in the second half of the last two games. They have not scored more than 10 points in the second half of a game in the Big 12 all season. Give, give me TCU on the road to not only cover, but to win straight up. I mean, Texas, yeah. the, Texas just is not going to get it done in the second half, and they haven't all year. Why is it going to change? I mean, again, for all the numbers that are there for the TCU offense, for me – this boils down to something very simple. It's Steve Sarkeesian, and you talked about it. Guys, I say it all the time. Coaching matters now, in, particularly more in the NFL than college. But if you're not including coaching in your handicap, you're, you're leaving a major part of 
how a team plays out of this out, out of your handicap, out of the script here. Steve Sarkeesian is not a good uh, ATS coach, never has been. Coming into this year, he only covered 41% of his games as a college head coach, failed to cover at six and a half points favorites at Oklahoma State, seven point favorites at Texas Tech, and 15 and a half point favorites hosting Iowa State. Their two covers uh, over a field goal in conference play came against the bottom feeders of Oklahoma and West Virginia. I mean, that, that's, that's what a – TCU is not a bottom feeder team. Uh, anytime you get more than a touchdown, it's an automatic fade for me on Steve Sarkeesian here. And especially when I get a team that is of this ilk, of this level with TCU, I got no problem back in the Horned Frogs here. All right, back to the SEC here as we went uh, – started in the SEC, went all the way out west. Now we're working our way back. LSU, Arkansas. LSU, now, I, you know, I'm seeing fours pop up. Um, maybe some three and a half still out there, but LSU laying three and a half to four total at 61 and a half. The under has gone five and one in the last six meetings in Arkansas between these two teams. Razorbacks, one and five ATS against teams with winning records. You know, it's the second year in a row that Arkansas has started out great and then sort of fallen off here. For me, this is situationally a letdown spot for LSU coming off a huge win against Alabama, having to go on the road against a team that runs the ball really well and is coming off a bad home loss to Liberty, uh, being a double-digit favorite here. I think Pittman has these guys extra focused this week. LSU comes in riding too much of a high. Uh, I mean, when you get me above a field goal, I love it. Will I say Arkansas can win this game outright? Maybe. Maybe they can. Um, but I also recognize the fact that LSU could blow this team out because Arkansas's defense is pretty bad. But still, I'll back the Razorbacks here. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Arkansas's defense is terrible. That secondary is just atrocious. Yeah. It's one of the worst secondaries in all of college football this season. And talking to the coaches there during the year, they knew that they had rebuild to do there. They did not expect to be anywhere close to what's going on there in the back end. And Barry Odom's got his hands full there, defensive coordinator for the Razorbacks. Jaden Daniels has turned it on here lately for LSU. He's averaging yep. 260 yards per game through the year. Seven touchdowns against zero interceptions during this three-game winning streak for LSU. If he continues to play that way, which I think he will against this Arkansas secondary, I, I got LSU covering, winning. But that 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 total right now, which I've seen at 61 and a half right now, I, I think I go the under there at the total right now. That Arkansas offense, oh my goodness. Just absolutely inept last week against Liberty. Again, I was yeah. there. I was at that game last week against Liberty. Liberty doesn't get enough attention for their defense, what they're able to do. Tackles for losses, sacks. They actually lead the country in sacks right now. Oh, but, that Razorback off, but that Razorback offensive line having some troubles here lately. And K.J. Jefferson yeah. going into that game last week, I'm going to tell you guys this right now, there were questions about his throwing shoulder, about an injury there. And watching that Liberty game, I think it was still bothering him a little bit. So that's another thing to watch today going into this game. This is, a, I think this is honestly probably a bad matchup for the Razorbacks. We're talking about Jaden Daniels, the way he's playing, Arkansas's pass defense, and then K.J. Jefferson, where they get a bulk of their rushing yards because of what he's able to do running yeah. in the middle of the field. His question, shoulder's a little messed up. I question why Raheem Sanders isn't being used more. Like, if for, Sam Pittman at points this year just did not give him the ball enough. Whether it's in the passing game and short passes or just straight-up runs, it's like, this is the best player on your offense. Get this dude the ball, put it in his hands. Um, and he's still leading the conference in rushing yards, but I think it should be by a much bigger number than what he already is. I think Pittman got a little bit away from his bread and butter when it came to just running the ball and wanted to sort of unleash K.J. Jefferson, and it hasn't always worked out. And as you said, he's been every time I've seen him run, it looks like he's getting hit by a freight train. This year, KJ Jefferson, he's getting banged around a lot. Yeah, and that's something to watch today. I, I, and listen, they they try to get that big play. They don't quite have the receivers this year. Landers has been pretty good for them, but Jefferson's a little bit off target last week, and uh, I think that's going to be a big thing to watch early in this game. You're going to get a very good feel of what this game's going to look like there in that first quarter. All right, let's go look at some college uh, football championship odds here. We have Georgia obviously leading the way at plus 105, Ohio State plus 180, Michigan at 8-1, to one, and then you go down the rest of them here and look at Tennessee 18-1, to one, Oregon 30-1, to one, Bama 40-1, to one, LSU and TCU trailing behind here. The way I look at this, Brandon, very simply is this. You see the odds there on our screen. There's only two viable bets to make at this point in time, honestly. It's Michigan and Oregon from a value standpoint. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sure, you can make an argument for Tennessee, but at some point they're going to have to play Georgia again, and uh, they're not going to win. That said, as soon as Michigan loses to Ohio State, you know, they're going to probably be on the outside looking in That's if that happens. And all you're banking on with Oregon is, is that they run the table and, you know, get lucky as far as winning two games in the college football playoff. But at a 31 ticket, you know, it, it's not exactly bad value. But how do you see uh, or where do you see rather the value for betting the national championship at this point? Yeah, I mean, Georgia's going to win it. No one's going to stop them unless it's in themselves. But the two best teams that match up with them and have a chance are Ohio State and Michigan. And obviously the best value here is Michigan. I love the way they play, play in the trenches. I know I keep talking about trenches, but, man, Michigan is impressive. I think J.J. McCarthy is going to be a big play, big moment quarterback for Michigan in some games here down this stretch. And the way that schedule works out for them going down the stretch here, if they – can beat Ohio State on the road, and they do so like much like they did last season by being the most physical team in the trenches, I think a lot of us are going to be sitting there going, you know what, maybe Michigan is going to beat Georgia and win the national championship this season. I really love this Wolverine squad. That's that's the team right now I put my money on if I'm looking for really good value. Their offense, I mean, it, it, sometimes it looked Blake Corum. Blake Corum, man, he's the man. I like McCarthy. I I think they're I think they're just fine. <laughs> Again, go back and look. I mean, they only score like thirty four against Maryland, who's not a very good defense at all. At times this year, I, I guess it's them just taking their foot off the gas pedal in games. But like that was a game that was closer than it should have ever been. And I know that because I backed Michigan in that game. Thought they were going to blow their doors off at home, and they didn't do it. Um, so I, I've seen certain games this year that make me just go, I have concerns about the, the potency of this offense and their ability to, to keep up with a team like Georgia that can score 40, to keep up with an Oregon that can easily score 40. I know how good their defense is, and they basically say, look, you're not going to score that much on us. So I understand that. But, you know, you have no concerns, eh? How many times is Georgia scoring 40-plus points this year? How many times have we seen them not be able to get out of their own way at times, even in games that they've been focused for? I, I think Michigan has a type of defense to keep Georgia in check. And if that offense gets going even to a faster clip, which I think it's fully capable of, I think a lot of that is just how they're drawing up game plans. They're not going out there trying to throw the ball over the yard and score 35, 40 points a game. They're just looking to go out there and do what they got to do to win, and they feel confident enough right. in their guys in the trenches to be able to dictate the tempo and do whatever they want to do. I mean, goodness gracious, look at I know it's I know it's Rutgers. But look what they did against Rutgers. Everybody's like, oh, Rutgers is up at halftime. The Michigan's like, all right, we got we got to do something different here offensively. And they score, what, 38 unanswered points So in the second half. I, I'm not worried about Michigan's offense. I, I love this Wolverines team. I think overall as a team, it's better than the one last season. So I, I don't have much trouble there just taking a quote-unquote chance of putting some money on them to, to win the national title this year. I think, I think no, them I and Ohio State are best equipped to beat Georgia. I agree, hundred percent. I mean, it, you know, I, again, I'm I'm, I'm a, a sort of quasi Michigan fan. You know, our our, our friend Lauren Jabbar is a is a Michigan homer, but uh, I'd love for Jim Harbaugh to win it just to shut some people up. I, I'm kind of that guy. When everybody hates one guy, I want him to win. Anyway, uh, let's go to the Heisman race. Uh, <laughs> C.J. Stroud here at plus one thirty. Hendon Hooker still hanging on at plus three fifty. Caleb Williams, a guy I was touting earlier on this year, at five to one. And then you get the big, you know, long shots here: Drake May, Bo Nix, Blake Corum, the guy you just talked about. Um, how is Stetson Bennett still in the Heisman conversation? We should, we need to end that chicanery at this yeah. point in time. Uh, that's, that's a joke. Yes. <laughs> that said, um, look, I, I'm going to pump Bo Nix here again. Think of it this way. And it, you have to have to run the table and get to the college football playoff for this to matter, right? But this is a guy who has the best completion percentage of any of these Heisman candidates. He accounts for more touchdowns per game by a wide margin, exactly four of them per game. Um, you know, his yards per attempt is right up there with the Bryce Youngs and everybody else. So it's not like he's one dimensional. Uh, and he's played a very, very good schedule this year against some legitimate opponents. So um, I, I would if I had a vote right now, maybe called prisoner of the moment. It probably would be for one of the two Pac-12 quarterbacks in either Caleb Williams or Bo Nix. Wow. Caleb Williams right now. Did you watch him I, last night? I it wasn't good. Oh my gosh, he was terrible in the first half of that game. He was terrible. I wouldn't even put Caleb Williams on the board right now, to be quite honest. I'm not been I just, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the overall offense. 
<laughs> um, you know, I, I like that pick with Bo Nix, but I, I'm going back to last year in the game with Ohio State and Michigan. And we a lot of us had a love affair over Aiden Hutchinson, and he balled out against Ohio State. And that made him rocket up the Heisman charge. And obviously, he didn't win it, and he wasn't going to win it. But that pushed him over the edge. And so I look – I, to me, I think it potentially will come down to the game and it being C.J. Stroud against Blake Corum. Blake Corum at Michigan averaging 160 yards rushing per game in the Big Ten right now. He has a very good opportunity to finish with 20-plus touchdowns, probably 25 on the ground by the end of this season. And if he can go on a tear here in these last three weeks, starting a day with Nebraska, which, goodness gracious, he might run for 225, if he goes into the game and piles up the yardage in a victory on the road, I, I think I think Blake Corum is a good bet right there to not only make it to New York City, but win the whole thing and kind of buck that trend of it not no, no longer being a running back award. Going to be interesting to see, to say the least. All right, uh, before we get to our uh, three stages of the day, uh, and before on. The PicksWise website. Want to remind you guys that PicksWise is presented by Superbook Sports. Go to Superbook.com, download the app today. And this season, we're all rooting for safeties. That's because Superbook will give you a $50 bonus on each safety scored this season. Just place a $100 pregame bet on any spread or total. And if there's a safety in any game on that Sunday, not just the one you bet on, any game, you get a $50 bonus. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Up on our website, PicksWise.com, we have several three-star plays of the day, including the one I will give you in a moment, which is my uh, play of the day here as well. we got a lot of other college football, even some NHL picks up on the website from Josh Wagner and Chris Murray. So go check out PicksWise.com. Again, download the PicksWise app, and you'll get all of the three-star plays that you need each and every single day, PicksWise.com. All right, Brandon, we're at that time of the show, the moment of truth. Uh, you are the wiser one, uh, younger one, smarter one, so I will allow you to tee us off on your three-star or, or your play of the day, rather. I almost went with the under in LSU-Arkansas, which is a 61 and a half right now because of Arkansas's offense struggling a little bit and LSU just not being the type that might just you know put 40 points up if they want to. But I'm going to go with Tulane at minus two right now against UCF in a game that's not getting talked about enough today in New Orleans for the pretty much the de facto AAC lead and maybe being the top team in the American Conference right now. UCF playing very well, but they've got questions at quarterback. John Reese Plumley, their top quarterback, who's a great dual threat runner for them in Gus Malzahn's offense, suffered a concussion and is questionable. They don't know if he's going to play in this game. I get the feeling he's going to play, but how's that change things for the offense? Because they've been preparing a lot with Mickey Keene there. Tulane playing so well right now. I'm a huge fan of Willie Fritz. I, I think they win today and they cover. Tulane minus two is my play of the day. Got to love the AAC. It's always worth a look to say the least. All right, for my play of the day, going out to the Big 12 here and TCU and Texas, and this number has absolutely hit a buy point. At plus seven and a half for the Horned Frogs here. Look, TCU has one of the best offenses in the country. Max Duggan leads the Big 12 in passing yards. And TCU also leads the conference in rushing yards per game. TCU comes at you for 60 straight minutes offensively. They average over 70 plays a game on offense. But the Longhorns are going to need a defensive performance similar to what they did to Alabama to slow down this Horned Frogs offense. And even in that game, when... When Texas slowed down Alabama, they still got 370 yards of offense in that game. This is a TCU offense that averages over 500 yards of offense per game. So it is going to come down to how well can Texas's defense play in this game. Now, TCU has only been an underdog once this year, and they covered at that point in time. A lot of people are waiting for TCU to fall apart. They went through a gauntlet of four top 20 opponents, beat them all, several road games that they've won on as well. But for me, mostly, this game is about fading Steve Sarkeesian as a touchdown favorite or more. He's not a great cover coach, not a great ATS coach. Coming into this season, he just covered 41% of his games. Earlier this year, the Longhorns failed to cover as six-and-a-half-point favorites at Oklahoma State, seven-point favorites at Texas Tech, and 15-and-a-half-point favorites against Iowa State. There are two covers of a game that was a field goal or more 
were against the bottom feeders of the Big 12 in Oklahoma and West Virginia. It's way too many points here to be laying to the number four team in the country with one of the best offenses in the country. TCU might not win this game, but they'll keep it within that seven and a half back in the Horned Frogs today for my play of the day. All right, that'll do I it for this edition. Pick. I love that pick, man. That's I appreciate it, baby. We're on the same side here today. We might not be in the same SEC sides today, but we're going to be on the same side for our plays of the day. Tulane and the Horned Frogs. Don't forget to subscribe to the PixWise YouTube channel as well. Download the PixWise app available at the Apple Store and Google Play. Let's Bet It is presented by Superbook Sports. For Brandon Marcello, I'm Mark Zeno. Have a wonderful Saturday. Go cash some tickets. Go get it. Go bet it. We'll talk to you tomorrow.